The triboelectric effect is largely responsible for what we call static electricity. Tribo comes from the Greek word to rub, so it literally means rubbing electricity, and it occurs when we rub two substances together. Now how well it works depends on the electrochemical properties of the substances themselves, as well as their textures, but it works pretty well when we use rabbit fur on acrylic. We make good surface contact between them, and the acrylic rips the electrons off of the rabbit fur. This leaves the acrylic negatively charged, and the rabbit fur positively charged. If we put a conducting plate on here, the electrons can't jump from the dielectric onto the conductor, because it's a dielectric. But they do generate an electric field. The electrons on the plastic push the electrons on the metal to the top, but they can't escape, because there's nowhere for them to go. So if I pull this plate back, it's still overall neutral. But, if I give those electrons somewhere to escape to, say, my body, the electric field from the plastic push the electrons from the metal onto my body, leaving this plate now positively charged. We call this sort of charging device an electrophorus. Now how can we tell that it's electrically charged? By using this electroscope. There's a tiny piece of gold foil hanging on a piece of metal. When electrical charge is introduced, they repel each other, so the gold leaf starts flapping about. So we can show that this has charge on it simply by bringing it close to the electroscope. Here I have a couple of ping pong balls one coated in carbon, and one that's plastic. This way we can show how a conducting or a dielectric material reacts to an electrically charged object. Initially, the conductor will be drawn in. As soon as it makes contact, though, the electrophorus deposits some of its charge on the conductor. Now, since they both have the same charge, they repel each other. The dielectric material, however, cannot take any of the charge from the conductor. So, when it gets attracted, it stays attracted. We can also try using a dielectric material, say this piece of wood, on our now electrically charged little ping pong ball. We can apply this same principle to this device, Franklin's storm bell. As the story goes, Benjamin Franklin had a lightning rod outside his house hooked up to one of these devices on his desk. They weren't as concerned with safety back then. When one of these plates gets electrically charged, it will attract this little conducting ball. It will hit it, have some charge deposited on it, and then be repelled to the other plate, where it will deposit that charge. It will then be repelled from that plate back to the first, and so on and so forth, until the charges of both plates have been equilibrated. For this one, I'll use a larger electrophorus because it can hold more charge. And I can jumpstart it again by siphoning some of the charge off the plate, thus imbalancing the charges again. Another quick, fun, and easy way to do this is by attaching your storm bell to a high voltage power supply. Right now there's about 2 kilovolts in between these plates. By maintaining a set voltage in between these two, their charge can never equilibrate. The dielectric breakdown of air occurs at about 3 kilovolts per millimeter. So we can figure out approximately how much voltage is on this 
by seeing how far away it discharges. Let's say from this metal rod here. That was about one centimeter away. So this little guy was holding 30 kilovolts on it. And yet I barely felt a thing. Since voltage is energy per charge, and this thing can't hold very much charge, which is to say its capacitance is very low, it can't put out a lot of energy. Oh, the balloon's still up. <laughs>